Good evening. Good evening. Um, quite an honor to be the person that kicks this whole series off. When Marta talked to me, she said about doing this, she said, I want you to just have a chat with the audience, except you can't talk back. <laughs> um, and so it's, uh, Don was exactly right. Uh, Texas has played a huge role in the space program, and not only did Houston Tranquility Base, the Eagle has landed, those famous words by Neil Armstrong, but there was also one by Jim Lovell on Apollo 13 said, Houston, we've had a problem. So, uh, which shows something that I, I kind of had a theme in this thing. We weren't perfect. Um, space flight is hard. It is tough business. It's extremely hard to get going fast enough to get into orbit. 25,000 feet a second, 17,000 miles an hour, you got to get moving. And you got to be up about 100 miles just to get to orbit. So it's a tough business. Um, it can bite you really, really fast. Um, I'm often asked the question, how did you get in the space business? And I'm going to try to really make it fast because it sets the stage for Apollo, which is what I'm really more known for, and it's also what I like the best, best job I ever had. Uh, better than being the director of the center, was being in flight operations during those lunar landings. Um, I graduated from Texas A&M in medieval times, um, <laughs> 1956, and in the mid-50s, there was no aerospace curriculum. I majored in aeronautical engineering. Everything from low-speed airplanes, high-speed airplanes, even hypersonic uh, theory. Nothing had ever flown that fast. <clears throat> but it was, uh, it was kind of a, my first answer is getting into NASA at that time was hard. It was not an easy job. I, uh, when I graduated, I had a four-year commitment to the Air Force, and, uh, and that was 1956, and there wasn't even a focused U.S. space program at that time. That all changed a year later, 1957, when Sputnik uh, flew. The Soviet Union put up this two-foot ball full of radios, antennas sticking out, going around the earth, beeping. That's all it did, beep, beep, beep but it was the first man-made satellite ever. And the race was on. Uh, at that point, this was at the, the Cold War was raging. It got as close to being hot right in that period uh, as any time in history. The, um, I actually, at the time that shuttle, or I'm sorry, the Sputnik flew, I was actually in uh, training in the Air Force, and NASA was formed the next year, in 1958. And by that time, I was in a fighter squadron in uh, California and had a lot of fun turning jet fuel into noise. <laughs> and, uh, but I had two more years to go, and I had a four-year commitment. I couldn't get out. I, Right then, I knew I wanted to be at NASA because I knew where it was headed. And this was before Kennedy's speech. But I had to wait. And then when I got out of the Air Force, NASA, by that time, had already started Project Mercury, which was the one-man capsule. I'm going to put it in context here in a, in a second. They were right in the middle of it, and they weren't hiring anybody. They were just trying to figure out how to get it off the ground. So I went to work for the Satellite Test Center, which was a United States Air Force facility, as a Lockheed Martin uh, employee. Actually, it was Lockheed Missile in Space at that time. And guess what? We were trying to launch the first spy satellites uh, to spy on Russia. And we put about as many as we got into orbit in the end of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it was, that's where I learned that Space flight was indeed very, very hard to do. 
Um, but I got my feet wet with a little bit of the space uh, mentality. Nothing like NASA was, would do later or anything like that. But at least Earth orbit was in a polar orbit. We were launching out of California where we could go polar in the world turning around you. You can see in 24 hours, you get a pretty good look at, at both sides of the Earth. And we were trying to look at the other side. So I, I just kept knocking on NASA's door. And finally, in 1964, they let me in. I would, have, uh, I would have loved to have been an astronaut, but at that time, they were, they were uh, mostly test pilots, which I wasn't. They were mostly, uh, they were about five to 10 years older than most of us in mission control, by the way. Um, they'd been around longer. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, <clears throat> I got into mission control, and from day one, I knew I was where I wanted to be. Um, it was exciting. It was, we just were starting the Gemini program. Now, Project Mercury was this one little capsule that so tight that the guys couldn't stretch out and, and make their body straight. It was that tight. Germany was pretty much the same way, except a little larger, but it had two people in it. All we actually proved with Project Mercury was that a person could survive in zero G and survive re-entry, survive exit and, and coming down. So <clears throat> that's about all we learned. We only flew four orbital flights. But Germany, we learned a bunch. We learned how to rendezvous, how to dock, how to do EVAs, extravehicular activity. The press <coughs> almost immediately called that spacewalk. And that's what you probably know it by, spacewalk. So it, it was a really learning experience in Germany. And then Apollo. Now, all of those I consider Apollo. That was really getting us to the moon. And so <clears throat> I'm going to spend the rest of my time here on Apollo. And boy, what a time that was. We got off to a very, very rough start. And again, a lesson of how tough it is. We had a fire on a pad. We killed three astronauts. That was in January of 1967. I was a GN still doing the same job I had done in Germany. I was a guidance, navigation, and control systems analyst. And I was getting ready to do the same thing for Apollo. And I was in the control center the night the fire happened, and it, like that, um, it was over. So we didn't fly for almost two years. And in that period, Chris Kraft, who was our big leader in mission control, decided he needed three more flight directors and he reached down and plucked me out and said, that's how simple it was, Mike, in those days. Today, it takes a lot of training and certifications and all that to do. But Chris reached down, plucked me out, and said, you're going to be a flight director. What's a flight director? Flight director runs mission control. Uh, all of us, there were six of us that did, because we had operate 24 hours, and we had multiple missions. We were flying about every six, six months. So uh, we had to have a number of people. There were six of us. And we worked ourselves to death. It was 24-7 a lot of the time. My son's in the back audience here somewhere. And I seldom got to see a... a baseball game, little league game, or Cub Scouts, and all of that. And the point I want to make here is, and it's still true today, the spouses saved our life. They did everything because we were so darn busy. Um, the flight director, all of us came up from the control center. We would have been in various positions. 
And it's like moving from playing an instrument in an or orchestra to being the director. Uh, you don't get to play the instruments anymore, but you make sure they all play together. And it was a very interesting job. You had to listen to a gazillion inputs, and you had the final go-no-go -no -go decision to make on everything that was done. Now, you got help. You had help that people were telling you these are the options. And, of course, we all knew the systems well, the flight directors. And we trusted our guys to give us the right info. But it came down to only you in the final analysis had to make the go, no go, which we did from the ground on everything in Apollo. That, that's changing with time a little bit, and I think it should, should have, as spaceflight matures. But in those days, we checked everything, every maneuver, every uh, everything. And it was, it was so fun when it worked. There's three no-goes, or goes that, go no-goes that I gave that, that will always be with me. One was the go for TLI, translunar injection, the maneuver that sent us on our way to the moon uh, the first time I had that responsibility. I, it still sends chills up my back to think about when you think, Capcom would go for TLI, and Capcom would radio up, you go for TLI. You're on your way to the moon. That was always kind of a gulp point, too. Uh-oh. <laughs> we just sent them on their way to the moon. We've got to get them back. Uh, the other one was Apollo 14 on landing. I was a flight controller, and we had a, a shorted switch that was going to make us abort if we didn't figure a way to get around it. And the guys at MIT went to work on it, we read up a bunch of numbers to the crew. They put it in through this keyboard, and we bypassed that switch. And when I said, we'll go for PDI, we powered descent initiation, typical NASA, go for landing. Um, I didn't think we were going to make it. And so that was, and then on Apollo 16, uh, I did the landing. I did three of the six that we did on the moon. And, and uh, we had a problem with the command module uh, engine that did all the major maneuvers to get us into lunar orbit and out of it to come home. And we almost did miss that one because we were running out of, of orbits that we could get to the landing point. But anyway, when we finally figured a way to do it, and I never will forget the program manager turned to me and he said, what do you think? And there's a fellow named Jim McDivitt who was a former astronaut, and I said, I think we're going to go for it. He said, have fun. And uh, so you go for power descent. Um, those three things, it, it almost made it worthwhile to go through all of that hard work and time and, and all of that. When I became a flight director, I was only 33 years old. And we were, I was second from the youngest of the flight directors, all of us in our 30s. And we were the oldest people in the room. We had flight controllers that were 22, 23, making critical calls. So it showed you what the country could do um, without, you know, without literally starting from nothing to, to what we got to in Apollo. And although you'll see a zillion photos and television and all that where we look grim and like we're really uh, concerned, let me tell you a secret. It was a hoot. <laughs> it was fun, even when things weren't going well, except for the fire. Of course, that it was not a launch. It wasn't a, it wasn't a flight. It was on the pad. But when things weren't going right, it was about as much fun as it was when they were going right. Now, you didn't think that at the time, but when I thought back about it, that's why we were there, is that's why we were there. So I really think the, the bottom line is this country can do anything it wants to when it puts its mind to it. And we did it. We showed that, and, and we beat the Soviet Union to the moon by quite a lot. Actually, when we orbited the moon on 
Apollo 8, which we just sent up at Christmas time, and, and uh, they orbited the moon, came home. They read Genesis in that process, and that, that threw Madeleine O'Hare into a fit. But um, anyhow, the, uh, it was over. The space race was over when we orbited the moon. We didn't know it, but the CIA did. Uh, they had had a terrible explosion. And they had their flight control uh, unit close to the launch pad. And the explosion was so large that it not only got the big vehicle they were going to go to the moon with, it also got about half of that building killed a bunch of people. So anyway, it was a fun time. And then we started doing something else. And at this point, I'm going to say, Mike Fossum, my good friend, astronaut, leader, uh, is going to come up and kind of pick it up from here and take you to shuttle in the ISS. Mm -hmm.